but hi everyone. Um, I'm Allison, and I'm one of the Planetary Innovator Speaker Series Coordinators. And we're excited uh, to host everyone today for this webinar with two incredible innovators. Um, a bit of background before we begin. The Planetary Innovator Speaker Series is a collaboration with the SCI Center for Innovative Thinking and Yale Center for Business and the Environment. The program features innovators who are developing and implementing planetary solutions to some of the world's most complex environmental problems. And today we're gonna to focus a little bit um, broadly on disaster resilience. Uh, so climate related disasters are increasing as the planet continues to warm. Innovative approaches to just equitable resilience are needed as communities across the US are faced with multiple and diverse events, including fire, flooding, and hurricanes. We're excited to have this webinar today, which features two innovators working towards accessible resilience in unique and important ways globally and locally. So I'll pass it over to Irvi now. Um, thanks. Thanks, Sally. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Urvi, and I'm the Environmental Innovation Fellow at CBA and Sci City. And very excited to have Andrea and Francisco with, uh, with us here today. And um, I'm going to be moderating the, um, the conversation. Um, and to start off, we'll just, uh, we'll hear from both of these um, incredible innovators. Um, a little bit about uh, what they've been working on, and then um, I will have a few questions for them. Um, and then we'll have opportunity at the end for, for the audience to ask questions as well, um, using the Q&A um, feature within the Zoom webinar. Um, and so um, with that, I'm excited to introduce um, Andrea uh, Shrestha, who is the co-founder of Luminade. Uh, Luminade develops innovative solar-powered products for disaster relief, humanitarian aid, and recreational use outdoors. Uh, the Luminate light is a solar rechargeable inflatable lamp that packs flat and inflates to create a lightweight waterproof lantern. And then Francisca Troutman is uh, the co-founder of Glass Half Full NOLA. Um, Glass Half Full works to fill a gap in New Orleans' uh, recycling program by collecting the city's glass and transforming it into sand and colored for disaster relief and prevention, coastal restoration, and eco-construction. Um, this was just a very short introduction, but I'm sure that um, there's much more interesting stuff that the panelists have to share, M much more interesting than anything that I could say. Um, and so with that, I just want to uh, first um, uh, ask Andrea to um, just talk a little bit about the work that you've been doing with Luminade, how, you know, what sort of prompted the idea, and then uh, what does the model currently look like? So um, the idea for Luminate came about uh, over 10 years ago by now. It was just after the Haiti earthquake. And my co-inventor, Anna, and I were students. And we were actually in architecture school, but like architecture and design. And so we were thinking through ideas about what could we design. I mean, like everybody else, we were watching on the news and just seeing these like terribly sad stories of people struggling in the aftermath. And so we were thinking, well, what kind of thing could we design that would help something in those situations? And often, I mean, a lot of uh, natural disasters and other types of emergencies, uh, the needs are really immediate for medical, water, food. And so something like shelter and or lighting is kind of further down the list, but we were thinking that it was something that could be helpful in those situations after dark and in a place like Haiti where the electricity grid was not super stable to begin with, much less after, you know, a massive earthquake. So we came up with this idea for portable solar lighting that packed flat because we wanted to make it such that it could be distributed in the large numbers easily that would that might be required in an emergency like that one. And also just have other features where you didn't need any additional batteries. Um, you could just charge it with the sun. They also happen to be water waterproof and um, and so that's basically where the idea came from and then in terms of working up towards the model um, the model for the most part was kind of working for working backwards from getting the product where we thought it would be most useful so fast forward I think the the 10 years and basically uh, the business exists on sort of a consumer level so we sell a product online and on Amazon and REI and then we also have worked with and partnered with um, NGOs, so non-governmental organizations in the area of disaster relief aid and other types of organizations that serve different types of needs in the world. And so we are kind of a supplier and a partner to organizations like that. 
who are responding to events like the one that happened in Haiti. Yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, and then um, um, shifting focus to Francisca for a bit, um, could you share a little bit about, again, you know, how this idea for Glass Half Granola originated and what does your model look like? Yeah, so um, like a lot of good ideas, it kind of started over um, drinking wine in college about two years ago. Um, situated in New Orleans where we didn't have reliable glass recycling throughout the entire state. And so we knew kind of the glass that we were contributing and using was all going to a landfill where it would never decompose or do any good. And then simultaneously situated in a city that is um, constantly bombarded by floods and storms and also losing coastline at an alarming rate. And so we kind of thought that we might be able to kill two birds with one stone and solve two solutions, um, solve two problems with one solution, which is recycling glass and then turning it into sand that can be used for um, sandbags for flooding and then also sand to restore coastline. So we started with that. Um, we started just in a backyard to start anywhere we could um, recycling glass. And now we are in a much more legit facility two years later, um, recycling about 100,000 pounds every month. And our model kind of works by um, getting glass via pickups and drop-offs. So we'll go to your door and pick it up for a fee. And then you can bring it to us if you want for free. Anyone can bring it. And then we'll recycle that, turn it into sand and gravel, and then sell some of the products and donate what we can um, to various causes like sandbags and coastal restoration. Yeah, thank you so much for providing that overview. Um, sort of diving deeper into what um, each of you talked about. Um, a question that I have for you, Andrea, um, early in, in Luminate's development, um, I know that you held several crowdfunding campaigns and also found Shark Tank success. Um, can you talk a little bit about you know, some of that early stage funding, what that looked like, um, and how has that influenced your current model of, of operations and funding? Sure, yeah. I feel like I have a shelf life of another maybe three to five years before I I basically forget about how long ago some of this this all happened. So crowdfunding. Um, so I, I mentioned that Ed and I were uh, in architecture school and crowdfunding actually was something that was used like we found out about it through even some of our like friends and classmates who had been using it to get even just one off design projects off the ground. So we thought, oh, you know, that's interesting. Um, and fast forward to, I guess, the universe of crowdfunding today, or even like over time, it's like crazy how much that exploded after, you know, a certain point. But when we were doing it, it was sort of very like, I think, early stages. So we didn't really know what we might find in doing a crowdfunding campaign, like the one that we did. But we knew that, so we had started with the idea of the product in as use for the, in use in the context for humanitarian aid. As I mentioned, like with the origin story with the Haiti earthquake. And then, I mean, I think we both had some instinct that like, okay, this could be useful for things like camping and whatnot. So in the, in the process of doing that crowdfunding campaign, what we were trying to do was just get to the next step of not making the product by hand pretty much, or just prototypes by hand. So how did we, how could we like scale up a little bit? And through the process of doing that campaign, we found, I think we learned a lot more than we realized we, we would come to know about even just early interest in what they could be used for. Um, how do we, or like even just customer segments. There was a surprising amount of like people from different countries that participated in that campaign. So it gave us a lot to think about in terms of like where Illuminate could go um, based on the like footprint of the interest we saw out of that campaign. And then Shark Tank was actually quite a bit later, like three or four years later. Um, in the course of the like 10 years, we ended up using crowdfunding several times also to like launch new products. And I think it's a pretty good part of the new product launch playbook, depending on the type of product. And then Shark Tank, we filmed in 2014, it aired in 20, early 2015. Um, that was another one where at the time people like the only option to get on the show was you really were just filling out a contact form on abc.com um these days i think it's far more 
multi-dimensional how they source um, people to be on the show or companies to be on the show. But I think what's true is in both cases, you just get very lucky. <laughs> um, and then once you're in Shark Tank, it was really good timing for us to take on an investor. So that one of our first pitches for investment just happened to be in front of the sharks. And also Mark Cuban was again, just very lucky. And yeah, I think that's, <laughs> I don't have much more like, a lot of people wanna know like, what are the tips and tricks to like Shark Tank or getting a deal on Shark Tank? A lot of it is luck. We prepared a lot, that is true. Um, but then ultimately, because Luminate also had this humanitarian aid component, and then also the commercial side, like we didn't have a lot of examples before. Like we watched a ton of episodes on the show, but we didn't necessarily know know like, okay, this shark is definitely going to jump on this because they invested in this other company. We just had so much going on with the humanitarian aid stuff that we were like, well, we'll just pitch it and see who who seems to be interested in it. But that, the one part we didn't prepare for was the part where people make offers. <laughs> so that was very much like on the fly. Yeah, I mean, it definitely sounds exciting. Um, and it sounds, you know, from both of your work that um, there are a few different segments that each of the products and services that you provide um, apply to. Um, and so I think that's, that's pretty interesting to see. And speaking of funding, um, Francisca, um, so, Glass Half Full has successfully embraced social media as a part of its communication strategy, and you've received millions of likes and views on Instagram and TikTok. Um, how has that played a part in either funding for your organization um, and then also advocacy and organizing during and after disasters such as um, hurricanes? Yeah, um, I, I can't say enough about how important it is for organizations and businesses to be on social media. We, in 2020, we thought we were too old for TikTok and we're so glad we started when we did. Um, we wish we had started sooner, honestly, um, because yeah, we got, we've received so many different um, partnerships and donations through um, just posting our story on TikTok. Um, you know, we were called up to do a documentary one day and um, on the last day of filming, Mike Rowe from Dirty Jobs came on and he was like, actually, I'm giving you a check for $32,000 and you're like on our reality TV show and they had found us through TikTok. Um, and yeah, we did a huge crowdfunding campaign through GoFundMe. And so using TikTok to, you know, garner support and get more eyes on it was so helpful. Um, especially because when when you post a lot on TikTok, other news sources take notice and they um, they then want to share it. So like Good Morning America or ABC News will say, can we share your TikTok? Can we share your story? And then that just gets it on so many more eyes and gets it to so many other people. So it's been incredible to see. And yeah, like we were saying, has also um, allowed us to grow our volunteer base locally and um, gather over a thousand volunteers in the New Orleans area so that when a disaster hits like Hurricane Ida, we can say, okay, we know this community that needs a lot of help, let's all go there and help them out, which is exactly what we did after Hurricane Ida. And we were able to send 600 people um, to an area in need. So it's just, it's been so helpful and incredible to see. Yeah, that, that sounds incredible. And, and definitely also speaks to the importance of having partners um, in, in the work that you do. Um, Andrea, uh, you know, you have this incredible program called Give Light, Get Light, um, where supporters earmark a solar lantern or a phone charger for a cause of their choice. And then you send the lights to your humanitarian partners who help families in need. Um, how do you go about, you know, choosing the humanitarian partners that you work with? And, and what does that, how do you, what's your strategy for, you know, working with, with partners? Yeah, that's a really good question, especially even as of this week. <laughs> um, my inbox is full of, you know, like related conversations um, with respect to what's going on uh, with, you know, the refugees situation in, in, um, in Europe and Ukraine. And so one of the things that um, once I finally figured it out, or I think Anna and I both figured this out and it kind of just like hit us all at once, that is true is when it comes to working in this sort of like 
channel, I guess, or working again backwards from getting the stuff where it needs to go. It's like you have the idea and the idea may have some useful features about it, like for example, illuminated lights pack flat and so they're um, compact, but just as much as the idea, the actual like logistics aspect of it is also part of as much a part of the product as anything in some of these situations. So in terms of the strategy for even like the list of organizations that we've been working with or increasingly working with on the give light, get light side of things, they tend to be organizations that um, can actually provide some support on the logistics front in terms of like getting the stuff where it needs to go. Um, or even just being able to manage the distribution on the ground because they're in a lot of very tough situations and like what happens on the ground is I think a lot to manage on its own. So the idea that just taking on and accepting more stuff in all cases may not actually work for some of the work that they do or are, are trying to like complete on the ground. And then the other thing about Luminated that's true is we have a we have a battery, like a lithium ion battery in our product. So there's a lot of just know-how in terms of how to ship that where it needs to go. So partnering with organizations that at least have some experience manage well, Luminate has experience managing that process, but finding collaborators who also are like open to what that entails is is helpful as well. Yeah, that's that's really helpful to know. And for anyone in the audience who's also trying to think about, you know, working on their own solutions, I think that's really important insight. Um, shifting the focus a little bit, um, Francisca, um, your website says that NOLA's current glass collection program is pretty inaccessible for, for most residents and it pro prohibits business drop offs and it's not really transparent. Um, so what relationship, you know, does your organization have with the government of the city and, you know, do you work with any formal offices to, to really institutionalize your program um, as a, a permanent recycling um, operation? That's a good question and something that we get often. Um, I would say that the, the government in New Orleans does not work against us, but they also do not work for us. Um, so we have had to do this kind of on our own um, because of the shortcomings of the government. And um, we've had to do a lot of things on our own because of that, like sandbag distribution, um, when a hurricane is coming and also disaster relief assistance after a hurricane um, hits. And um, yeah, I think in New Orleans especially, but also Louisiana as a whole, there's just a lot um, to deal with, especially when it comes to climate and sustainability. Louisiana currently ranks 50th in the country in sustainability and recycling, so we're pretty far behind. And it's kind of an uphill battle to, to fight it, especially with um, a lack of funding and so we are friendly with a lot of our like city officials our council members um even like some people in the governor's office but we have yet to see any like help in terms of like payment or any support like that but we have discussed um you know setting up more city-run drop-off programs in order to collect the glass and bring it to us and it's sort of a when we're ready we'll kind of make that happen um, but yeah, that's kind of the relationship with, with the city government that we have right now. Yeah. And I, I'm sure it's a really nuanced and complex process. Um, so yeah, props to you on sort of trying to work within the system, but also outside the system. Um, uh, so most of the, I, I believe a lot of people on this call, um, are, you know, students at university or recent, um, recent grads. And I know that both of your um, sort of ideas for your organization sort of came out of um, a university ecosystem. And, and if I have this right, Andrea, you're also a Yale um, alum. Uh, but I'm just curious to, you know, if you have any advice for entrepreneurs um, just starting out or currently in university and what are the, the sort of skills or the ideas that, that you know, you would recommend people look at uh, when thinking about developing their own solutions, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna first start with Francisca and then um, move to Andrea. Yeah, um, I would say my biggest piece of advice is probably just to start. Um, if you have an idea, if you want to make something happen, especially while you're a student, if you're still a student, um, just start because um, every university, Tulane had something. I'm sure Yale's is even better. Has a support system to help you 
um, kind of like nurture your idea and get professionals to give you advice and things like that. So I would say however small it needs to be, just start, tell someone your idea, tell someone what you're thinking about. And I guarantee you, someone will know someone who can help you and then they'll know someone who can help you with something else. And it's just, it's such a great environment to be in at a university um, with the support of so many professionals and so many smart people. And um, yeah, so just start anywhere you can. You don't need like the polished business plan. You don't need like the fundraising plan. You don't need all of that in the beginning. You'll learn it along the way. Um, Cause I certainly did, you know, I started in a backyard. I didn't have any recycling experience. I didn't study sustainability or anything like that. Um, so I just kind of learned as I went and just grew as I was able to. The just start is is great advice. <laughs> um, I think that's also basically what happened to Anna and I as we were kind of getting going and like the more questions we would have asked at the time, I think the less we would have done it <laughs> to the extent that we pursued Luminade. Um, I think the other sort of the like in terms of tackling really big problems. I think to the extent that we were doing it, we didn't really know like the extent even of the problem, but working backwards from something is really helpful and then breaking it into smaller steps just makes it more of like, and like the plan is always going to change too. So it's not about like anchoring to something that like, you know, here's the 50 steps to get to from A to Z. And, and this is how it's if like, and expect for that to actually like play out in that way. But for some reason, having the plan helps even in the face of things like changing or pivoting or as they like the concept of pivoting. So that's, I think, the other thing I would keep in mind. And then I think, I mean, we were very much accidental entrepreneurs. I'm not even sure we knew what that was. I ended up going to business school after I was in grad school. So it's been quite a journey. And I did, uh, I am a Yale alum. I did my undergrad at Yale. Um, but the, um, the thing about like the accidental nature of how we went about it, I think early on sort of did help us because we were just really focused on the solving the problem and not necessarily building up the business case. That being said, when you're in an, like a university environment, what's really nice and what happened to us is that all of these gaps of experience or just even exposure that we didn't have we were in a place where we could go find, you know, like the business school at Columbia, so we were in grad school was just next door. So we could just go kind of talk to somebody about what's a business plan or that kind of thing um, as, as we progressed. And then we started needing more of that sort of like, more of that sort of help and also the templates. So if you're starting from, I guess, put it a different way, if you're like in a business school, then like talk to people at XYZ other sort of school or, like established relationships because there aren't a lot of places where you have that much in one place in terms of experts or people who are interested in certain topics. Yeah, I think that's that's really helpful advice um, for, for anyone. Um, so thank you so much, both of you, for sharing that. Um, speaking a little bit about um, the actual disaster um, resilience work, uh, Francisca, one goal of Glass Half Full is to use a recycle stand to begin restoring Louisiana's fragile um, shoreline. And since Louisiana has lost so much of its wetlands, you know, which also contributes to flooding, do you work with existing programs restoring the land through nature-based approaches? And how does that look like, uh, you know, on both a practical and an ecological level? Yeah, so because it's such a new kind of idea and new material to use recycled glass sand on the coast, um, we're doing a lot of research up front, and thankfully we were awarded with Tulane University a National Science Foundation grant in order to do the research required to actually, you know, use this for the coast. So we're partnered with ecologists, with chemical engineers, with civil engineers to test all of these different applications and see, um, you know, how it interacts with fish and crabs and how plants grow in the material, um, how microbes interact with those plants because of the sand. And different things like that and then also how the sand 
um, behaves compared to traditional dredge sand that is used for coastal restoration generally. So we're luckily funded to be able to do all of that research and, and that's ongoing right now. And the first demonstration site that we hope to do will be um, this coming April. So that'll be the first kind of time we put sand on the coast or near the coast um, in order to kind of observe how it behaves and how it works, um, how plants grow in it and all that good stuff. So luckily we're able to do all of that science with scientists and engineers at Tulane. Yeah, thank you. That that sounds exciting and kudos on, on all of the work that you've put in so far. Um, and then um, for, for Andrea, um, you, you know, you currently market your products as outdoor cure or for use in relief in humanitarian aid situations. But as disasters become more prevalent in the US, um, especially and also abroad, um, has your marketing or business plan changed or, you know, what, what does that look like with, you know, just an increased um, frequency of, of climate um, induced disasters? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think what's, what is definitely true is, I mean, in some of the earlier questions, like response about even the crowdfunding campaign, I was saying, you know, there's this humanitarian aids, there's this consumer side, and then there's the humanitarian aid side. I think I never would have guessed though, like, you know, 2021, looking back, um, or even 2022, that the instance of even just power outages, like what you would say, like domestically, I guess, at home, would create such a need for um, a product like a, you know, solar lantern or a solar phone charger that isn't really like what you would have imagined when you think about like the humanitarian context, for sure. Um, but that being said, the I think the what like an example that really comes to mind even from last year like Hurricane Ida for example these things happen and when they would happen say like five years prior it's just like okay you know the power will be on in three days and that's usually what would happen um but in that case it was you know some people went a month without like power well I guess Francisca you may know more specifically about this because it was in a geographically like in an area in an area that you know but um yeah that was really surprising actually so like that's a really good example where it's sort of like even post disaster the geography of it didn't seem to matter anymore the power was still out for a very long time even even in places where you would think have traditionally like infrastructure that comes comes back on pretty immediately after and then the other instance that definitely we see a lot more is just power outages in the context of like the Texas power outage that happened last year, or the even in California in years prior where they were having to do the planned um, power shutoffs because of the wildfire risk. And in order to sort of reach those types of, I think, use cases or people who are intending to use products for that reason, I mean, channels like even Amazon. I think are the ones that are reaching people most in that way. Uh, sorry, not Hurricane Ida. These are the other types of power outages. And I wouldn't have ever matched those two things together, like that type of channel with this type of use. Originally it would have just been people are on Amazon buying their camping supplies. So it has been very interesting, if not startling, to see the increased kind of convergence and not necessarily for a good reason. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that. And yeah, it's it's definitely, um, I'm sure it's, it looks different than what you um, initially imagined this to, to be. Um, I'm going to try something a little different um, and not something that I, I said, you know, not something that we shared uh, in the initial email, but I'm curious to see if both of you have question or like something that you're curious about each other's work. Um, so yeah, wondering if, you know, maybe Francisca, if you wanted to to start off and feel free to like take a few you know seconds to, to think about this but since there's so much overlap in you know your stories and the work that you're doing just curious to see if if francisca maybe if you have a question for, for andrea and then you know likewise if, if andrea you have a question for francisca sure yeah um i think it's interesting that we are both technically businesses but we both have kind of missions that revolve around like helping people and doing good so I'm wondering like what your experience has been navigating this space as a business, but as a business that wants to like aid people, you know.
from your meeting? Meeting. <laughs> um, I think <laughs> that is a really good question. It's a big one, I think, because it applies to certain types of social enterprises because it can be very hard to balance both, um, even just time-wise, like how much time do you dedicate, or like how much in my inbox, for example, this week, do I dedicate to getting, you know, donated lights where they need to go in the context of this like current crisis um, and that kind of thing. And so um, the framework of prioritization, I think is very important so that you know when to just drop other things. So as it relates to stuff like, you know, disaster, helping our partners respond to disasters, unless it's like the IRS or somebody <laughs> that I have a deadline that I would have a deadline for or something like that, it really is like, all hands on deck and then also working backwards from the immediacy of it also because so much of it is like dealing with disaster relief aid but it is very challenging or has been very challenging i don't want to create like a whole nother conversation but luminade was actually acquired at the end of 2021 um so it's been very new like territory in terms of working with the acquirer one thing with them that i mean in the conversations with potential acquirers this company is not traditionally a social impact company. They have, it's a camping brand. They sell different products for like camping and outdoor preparedness. So there's some nice overlap there. They did seem to be, of everyone I spoke to, the most open to learning about, you know, the programs and the models and the mission that we had set up, which definitely was very high on my priority list in terms of what happened next with Luminade. So I think it's just having the framework and then applying it even in really unusual instances such as like who you might be talking to that might want to own you know the company you started um but yeah yeah we're going through that now considering like fundraising um and making sure we choose an investor that does prioritize our impact um over just our profit yeah i skipped over um the investor part but mark cuban was also just like that like just very open to letting us do what we wanted to do to put our best foot forward in terms of the mission and then supporting it however he could. I'm sure if there was something about it that he didn't like about it, he might've said something, but it never really, he was always just very supportive of it, which was helpful. One less thing to think about. Um, in terms of my question for you, it's sort of, we are a little different in that we have, I, you know, I've taken apart Luminate products, but I've actually never manufactured one. I made one myself. Um, but other than the very early prototypes, it sounds like you have a pretty hands-on operation going on in terms of like your closed loop supply chain. To what extent do you get your hands dirty with all of that? And is that something you find satisfying? And yeah, what does that whole picture look like? That's a great question. I have a love hate relationship with my hands-on job. Um, in the beginning, it was definitely way too hands-on, which is why I kind of got a, a bit of a negative, you know, connotation to it. I was acting like an employee every day and not as an owner. Um, you know, I was there collecting glass and recycling and, um, you know, probably it wasn't until like a year and a half in, and we're only two years in, that I finally got to take my hands off a bit more. And now I kind of miss it. And I want to like go in and see like what everyone's working on and help, you know, our employees fix the conveyor belt and help get new machinery set up and stuff like that. So it's definitely, I'm now trying to find like a balance. Like I probably need to find like, like carve out certain aspects of my day where I go to the warehouse and like see what's going on because now I feel a bit like too far away from it. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been hard trying to find that balance and especially with like being able to hire enough people and, and things like that. Great, thank you so much, um, both of you for being such good sports. And those were really interesting questions. Um, I have one last question for both of you uh, before I hand it off to, to Alison. Um, so uh, Andrea, you've sent a lot of your products um, outside the US, um, really all across the world. And so what does it look like to work with different partners in different countries? And, and you know, how, has your, how do you adapt your approach to fit um, a certain geographical context? Is, is it pretty uniform or does it vary from geography to geography and culture to culture? Yeah, we've done a few things, I think, specific to that question, including translating our instructions um, wherever it made sense or the distribution was large scale enough that 
it seemed like people would need to know a little bit more about how to use the product. I think once again, we've just been also lucky to work with a bunch of really great organizations who kind of take on that work themselves as well in terms of contextualizing all the stuff that they distribute and um, with like the local area or working even additionally working with local partners in those distributions as well. Um, I think, but coming from that from another direction, we always have tried to keep in mind like how do we make this product that is somewhat like looking like a foreign object to begin with, at least as easy and intuitive to use, taking out as much of the like language aspect even as we could. Um, so like even picture diagrams and things like that. Would I, what I would love to say that we had more feedback on this topic from the field. I think we get some from these partners who are doing the distributions, but even for them, it's quite hard, I think, to follow up or make the commitment to keep following up even like, you know, a year after they may distribute product. But we have, we have had some kind of con like communicate back feedback. And we also, we actually, a lot of people think that Anna and I would travel out to all these places, like, which we wouldn't do. For one thing, I think we would have been in the way. Um, but, but the we did get a chance to go to Malawi at one point with one of our partners uh, probably six or seven months after there, there had been some like flooding and a disaster there where they did a distribution so we did like a monitoring they call it a monitoring and evaluation trip and I think the it was it was actually very satisfying to see that people had been able to figure out the product or figure out like how to use it over time if that didn't necessarily happen right away yeah, that's that's really interesting to, to hear, especially because um, here at Yale we're sort of trying to to diversify um, the you know the solutions and the the innovators that we um, highlight uh, you know with a focus on global innovation. So it's really interesting to hear about about your approach with this. Um, and that my question for Francisca, um, you, you know, you've uh, you've designed the blueprint needed to successfully launch a grassroots recycling, you know, glass recycling operation in in communities. And can you explain your process of you know developing this blueprint to trial and error? And what are your plans for franchising your model in the future? Would, would you know would you want to uh, sort of uh, expand to other cities in the U.S. abroad? Uh, what does that look like? Yeah, um, I think you you kind of said it already. Our plan was basically trial and error until we got it right. Um, and we're still, you know, trial and erroring our way through a few other issues as we scale up um, and sort of figuring out what what truly works best. And I think that's a benefit we have um, as opposed to other like larger businesses and other, you know, especially like governments who traditionally do the glass recycling is that we can make mistakes and you know try different things and see what works and what people like and what people respond to and so that's been something that we've um really been able to do and kind of are finally feeling very comfortable in our processing and, and our ability to collect glass and turn it into something useful and then get that product out the door and get it into people's hands and where it needs to be um, and so yeah hopefully within the next few years we will be able to expand to other cities um, we're kind of open to anything really. I think we're going to start in Louisiana first because there's no glass recycling in the whole state right now. So we're hoping to expand throughout the state. And then after that, we've gotten calls from like so many different places. Um, I think I'm most excited about Hawaii. So maybe we'll go there first because um, they also don't have glass recycling and they also have a coastal erosion crisis. And so that kind of makes sense there. We've gotten you know, people from Ecuador, from Colombia, from Canada, like so many different places um, that want to do this as well. And so there's a lot of possibilities there, but we're, we're taking it slow and kind of, um, yeah, starting local first, and then we'll move out to different places as we can. Great, thank you. And, and best of luck on that. Um, Thanks. And yeah, with that, I just want to hand it off to, to Alison um, to, to continue um, and seeing, you know, if there's any questions from the audience, feel free to drop something in the Q&A um, function. And yeah, Ali, if you, if you would like to start with a question. Um, thanks, Irvi, and thank you to you both. This has been so interesting. Um, I, I have a question. So I, I'm currently um, in a master's in environmental management um, degree. 
And one thing that I've found in, in speaking with friends is that um, it's this weird dual issue of climate change is kind of good for business in the way that it 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 creates jobs, it like proves our point. It's it's um, but it's also horrible, and you don't want these things to happen. Um, constantly being around um, disaster and and hardship and seeing communities struggle. In both of your work, you you guys both face um, real people. You're you're helping people um, who are coming out of intense uh, circumstances and situations. And how do you balance this sort of urgency um, to innovate? and embracing the fact that we will be having more disasters with also the personal resilience of like, how do I embrace hope and joy and also like the work that I'm doing and, and find happiness. And I think that's something that, um, I know there's like some people from the business school here, but also some people from the school of the environment and um, for socially minded folks who are doing this work, uh, what sort of advice do you have from your own journeys? Thanks. Um, I guess I can take a pass. I guess, yeah, thanks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Sure. No, that's like a very, like, zen question that, I mean, honestly, like, part of the reason I sold the business when I did was also because I realized, like, I had just become kind of a, like, just always, like, just get the next thing done versus, like, you know, what's the deeper meaning here a little bit, <laughs> just because I didn't have time to really even think about it for most of the time that I was like more hands on running Luminade. But I think that's also where it's just another thing where it's like you get very lucky if you end up doing something where it's like just doing the work in the end actually has this like tangible benefit for somebody else because I think that is very satisfying even if you're not necessarily like thinking about it every day. There's always going to be some byproduct of that if you've, you're doing something that is that has like an inherent social mission to it or the product solves a problem or your product or service solves a problem for somebody that benefits them in some way. Um, so that's sort of for me like the sweet spot, just the product and solution or service. Does it does it actually help someone else even just like does it save them time or help them do something else they wouldn't normally have done um, in that moment. So that for me is also like lighting and being able to charge your phone and communicate in the context of disaster relief aid. Um, if it's a very satisfying feeling because it feels like it's helping somebody else be productive in the way that I like to be. Um, so that always was true the entire time. Yeah, Luminade. I don't know if that exactly answers your question, but it's something that if I like look back and think on it, that's one of the things I find most satisfying about it. I think for me, it's that um, after a disaster, especially in New Orleans and the Louisiana region, that's a time when you see the most people coming together. And this sounds really like hokey, but like <laughs> people coming together and helping other people, people you would never see helping each other in general. And it's just such a beautiful thing to see, like when everyone's power was out, but you know, there were a few places that had solar or somehow didn't lose power you know they were inviting people over come shower at my house i don't know you but come use my shower and come charge your phone and um you know there was just so many random acts of kindness that it's really invigorating to be around and sort of just like ignites your mission even more um and makes it even more like important for you to continue your work and to continue doing what you're doing so that is something for me that is really inspiring to see Awesome, thanks guys. Um, we have uh, an answer, or sorry, a question from Dahlia. Um, so for Andrea, how do you see Luminade's humanitarian partners shifting their strategy to resilience versus a more traditional approach of disaster response? And how has this changed in recent years? Um, I think I know the Dahlia that asked this question, maybe. I think she <laughs> used to be my colleague at Luminate. Actually, that's why I'm smiling. Um, it's a good question. Um, as far as, I mean, I suppose if I'm defining resilience, maybe I'm not quite getting this right, but it's like over time almost being like, pre uh, not preventative, but like having a more sustained impact and not just in the moment after, after disasters. And I think it's a question that a lot of the people that we're partnering with, you know, either through the Gillette program or some other, even just like the organizations that we supply to are thinking about in a lot of different ways. Quite honestly, ultimately, probably the most resilient thing 
that can be done, I think is like the going sort of take on and just giving people even just funding so that they can then sort of long term rebuild what they need to do. So in the context of the distributions and things that happen after specifically a disaster, other than like, you know, the life saving stuff. So when we're talking about like shelter and lighting or even right now in Europe, it's very cold. So like blankets, sleeping bags, tents, the whole idea is you don't want them to be permanent, I think is, and I think, I think a lot of humanitarian aid organizations are starting to think differently about that as well. That if two years after that, people are still using the sleeping bags or the tents or even like the luminated lights in the context of the tent, um, that like the goal was, should have been bigger than that probably. Um, but I think it then on the other hand, it's sort of like you need stuff in place initially to sort of get there, get people to a certain platform from which they can then do that kind of like thinking or planning even on their own. Great. Um, thank you. I, I think um, I just wanted to ask, I guess, both of the um, panelists, if you had any final thoughts um, or any, uh, if there were any final questions from the audience, um, and otherwise I'll hand it over to Irvi. Yeah, um, I guess, you know, in, in terms of the closing thoughts, um, you know, if each of you could maybe take a minute and just talk through what are the next, you know, what is the next um, sort of big challenge that, that you want to tackle and what does that look like for, for each of you, you know, what are you hopeful about and what do you want to just get in there and tackle? Um, I think that'd be really inspiring um, to, to end on. And yeah, maybe I'll go to, to Francisca first. Sure, yeah. So I think globally there's um, a lot of glass to be recycled and a lot of coast that needs restoring. So I'm hoping to be able to continue refining this model that we have built in New Orleans and um, be able to replicate it in other cities um, around the world, either, you know, personally through Glass Hat Full or helping other organizations um, to get this work up off the ground. So that's kind of the goal is to just make it bigger and better. Um, the, the nice thing about the acquisition um, for me is that I'm no longer like, you know, payroll administrator or like all of these other things I used to do um, that now the acquirer has absorbed. So I, what, in what I am sticking around to do, it is more, much more focused on the, you know, working with humanitarian organizations through the various programs that Luminate has, or even just networking with new ones to see how we can help them um, in their future responses and work. And so, there's no real end goal to that, which is also kind of nice, like for once. Um, and that's as far as I've thought it through. I mean, I know I want to talk to more of them. So that's pretty much the only, that's pretty much the extent to which I've thought through next steps. Great. Um, thank you so much, um, Francisca and Andrea, for, for being here today. I just want to give a huge shout out to, to Alison, who, um, uh, was really monumental to this panel. Um, so, and, you know, so thank you for all of the work that you've done. And um, thank you, Francisca and Andrea for taking out the time to, to chat with us today. We're really uh, grateful for, um, uh, you know, for you sharing your insight and thank you to the audience for, for being here. Um, and ju just as a, as a note to folks, um, Startup Yale's applications are open. So in case you're, um, uh, in, interested and excited about what you heard about today and inspired to, to solve a problem, just go to www.startupheal.com and you should have all of the information there. Um, great. And yeah, with that, uh, just want to wish folks um, a good evening and thank you for being here. Thanks for having me.